Hi, um, we're here to talk about Firehose, a unified message bus for infra services. I'm Matt Trinish. Yeah, I'm uh, his faithful sidekick, Jeremy <laughs> Stanley. Uh, so um, traditionally, uh, OpenStack presentations always start out with a big complex diagram, uh, and uh, OpenStack infra is no different. We have a very large collection of diverse systems that we manage. Um, but uh, you've all seen complex diagrams before, so I just sort of punted and uh, let you use your imagination. Um, and that's where Firehose fits in. So there are all of those really different services that the Infra team runs. Um, some of them emit events, some of them don't. Um, but they all have their own way of emitting events to other services and end users. And Firehose was our attempt to unify that to a single place for users and other software. Um, we decided to use MQTT, which is a protocol that's very popular in the IoT space, but is really lightweight and really um, low bandwidth. So it was a good, well suited for our application here, where we have a lot of services sending a lot of data. It's also quite reliable. Um, so our firehose is actually called firehose.openstack.org is its host name. Um, we have anonymous read-only access to the MQTT bus over 1883 on TCP. We also support SSL slash TLS uh, on um, 8883, um, which is the standard ports for both for the protocol. There is also WebSocket support. Um, so MQTT as a protocol can be encapsulated in WebSockets, and you can expose that. And it, uh, it's temporarily disabled on our system, but our hope is to re-enable it in the near future. Yeah, I think there, there was a LibWebSockets bug that needed yes. addressing. So. There's a LibWebSockets bug, which is causing uh, denial of service attacks when you connect over WebSockets. <laughs> not, not very pretty. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, feature. <laughs> um, so talk a little bit more about MQTT, since especially in this community, it might not be something you're super familiar with unless you do home automation or you know, have a connected toaster. Um, MQTT is a pub-sub message pro messaging protocol. Um, it was formerly called the MQ telemetry transport or the message queuing telemetry transport, but there was a, an extensive argument in the technical committee for the MQTT specification, and they decided that MQTT stands for nothing. Um, it is an ISO standard. Um, if for people who know ISO standards, 2922. Um, and the protocol dates back to the late 90s, um, be uh, collaboration between IBM and I can't remember the name of the other company, but that's okay, I work for IBM. Um, <laughs> they would prefer you not remember the yes. other company. Um, and it's lightweight by design and low bandwidth. It's actually, and designed for flaky network connections. It's designed to be a reliable, lightweight connection for edge devices to send telemetry back. Fl flaky network connections, that sounds like the internet. Yeah, and specifically public clouds. Yes. <laughs> Very specifically. Um, uh, and one of the coolest things with MQTT are their topic system. Uh, topics in MQTT are dynamic and hierarchical, um, and they support wildcarding, which means that um, something that's publishing data to an MQTT broker can build up a hierarchy of what that information it's sending is, um, and then users who want to listen to pieces of that can filter on just those pieces, and it's all done dynamically. Um, and while that's abstract and confusing, I have a simple example. Um, so let's say my laptop was talking to an MQTT broker. Um, it, would send it would send the payload with the hard drive temperature to the topic sensors, Sinanaju, which is the host name, slash temperature, slash device name. And then if I was you know, the administrator wanting to monitor everyone's hard drive temperature at, on whatever broker, I could wildcard on just sensors and temperature, or I could monitor all of the temperature sensors on my laptop, or I could just monitor all of the sensors for my laptop. And you can see how this dynamic wildcarding will um, gives you a lot of flexibility in what kind of messages you receive from the broker as a uh, consumer of events. Um, which is something that other messaging systems don't really have. Uh, they tend to have static topics, and you subscribe to the topic, and you get all of the events. But having this dynamic, wildcardable um, system gives it a lot of flexibility and lets you get just the data you need. Right. Uh, so, so filtering at the server side, um, critical in this case because we named it Firehose for a reason. We expect it to be 
providing large volumes of data, and you're not going to want to have to filter it at the client. Um, the other thing that MQTT provides is levels of quality of service. So by default, when you send a message, there's no guarantee you're actually going to get it. The broker just sends it. And this is done for um, the lightweight aspect of it. Um, without providing any guarantees, it's very simple and low uh, util resource utilization. But there are also methods of specifying more guaranteed message delivery. So there's QoS1, which guarantees the message will be delivered at least once, um, but no guarantee that it won't be delivered again. And QoS2 goes to all available effort to guarantee that the message is delivered once and only once, and it does a four-step handshaking process between the client and the broker to make sure the message was delivered only once. And the trade-off is as you increase the level of quality of service, it increases resource utilization on both the client and the broker. And, and, and also network traffic volume a little bit on the handshake as yeah. well. Um, so for MQTT clients, one of the biggest advantages of this protocol is that it's used everywhere for IoT at this point, which means that there are bindings available for every language you could, or at least I could think of, and then some I've never even heard of. Yeah, we tried to think of some at random, and yeah, they were there. Yep. Um, my favorite from that wiki page is Lotus Script. Uh, come back to the IBM employer and hoorah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, I mean, Lotus Script, uh, we have examples on the documentation for Haskell and Ruby and you name a language, there's probably a client binding for it somewhere. Um, and in particular, I wanted to call out the Eclipse PAHO project, which is an effort from Eclipse to have a standardized interface between multiple languages. Uh, obviously, the exact semantics are going to be different because each language has different syntax, but the way they behave and operate are very similar across multiple languages. Um, and if you're writing client code for different languages, it's useful to use those clients because then it'll be similar in behavior between all of the languages you're writing clients for. Um, and then the other aspect of MQTT is the broker. It has a centralized broker as opposed to something like ZeroMQ, and it um, enables, it's where all of the uh, message passing goes through. Um, there are a lot of different options out there, some open source, some not. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at all of the options. A popular choice is Erlang. The trade-offs with Erlang are it gives you distrib uh, distributed brokers that are HA and clustered, but there's a big CPU and memory penalty for it. Um, there are two popular Erlang implementations, uh, VernMQ and MQ EMQTD, which are both written in Erlang and very similar, and both of their documentation go to great length to explain how they're different from each other. Uh, <laughs> But we ended up going with Mosquito. Um, it's a very lightweight MQTT broker implemented in C and a very popular choice with a lot of uh, open source home automation software. Um, it's an Eclipse IoT project and it supports the MQTT 3.1 and 3.11 uh, protocols. Um, we picked it mostly because it's C and very lightweight. We know how to, in the infra community, we know how to maintain C software. Erlang is not so much, and the lightweight aspect, the resource utilization, as you'll see in a bit, is kind of staggering when you think about how much data we're passing through it. Um, so uh, just to start out, uh, from the infrastructure side of this effort, um, like most of our infrastructure that we run, uh, we've got a virtual machine in Rackspace that we have deployed the software on through configuration management. Uh, There's a puppet module that Matt did the majority of the legwork on that uh, does the Mosquito broker deployment. Um, so Mosquito broker on it, um, just running one instance right now. We've got some ideas on how to do a high availability, a high availability setup with it, but uh, for our current use cases, it's not necessary. Um, so we're kind of going to cross that bridge when we, when we come to it. Um, Hardware specifications, we tried to start out fairly minimal uh, while still targeting the expected uh, publisher and subscriber capacities that, um, that we have for, for our initial use cases. And we may, we may scale this system up more as we, uh, as we get further into to other use cases down the road. But uh, it's really just two virtual CPUs, uh, not really super fast uh, virtual CPUs at that, a couple gigs of RAM. Um, 40 gigs of root file system and 
Uh, the flavor we're using is, is basically capped at about 200 megabits of bandwidth inbound and 200 outbound, yeah. um, so pretty minimal. It's worth pointing out that my laptop is significantly faster than this instance. Yeah, yeah. Um, the services that we've got deployed on it now, uh, for anyone who wants to go in there and subscribe and start you know, looking, uh, we've, we've got the Ansible wheel that we use to deploy our configuration management to all of the infra, uh, community infrastructure servers. Um, Matt wrote a callback that he's working on getting upstreamed into to Ansible itself um, that can basically emit MQTT uh, notification directly into our broker. Um, so you can, you can kind of watch things getting, notifications of things getting deployed on our servers uh, through the fire hose. Um, pretty much anything that is in the Garrett event stream uh, is also showing up in the fire hose now. We've got, uh, again, Matt wrote uh, a little uh, feeder daemon called Garrett MQTT that just listens to the SSH-based uh, event stream coming out of Garrett and translates those messages as it receives them into MQTT notifications that go out on the broker. Um, we've uh, got a launchpad client, Matt wrote, that is uh, effectively a mail client. Um, because about the only way to get notifications out of launchpad uh, is via email. So it's subscribed to official OpenStack projects, I think, or the, yeah, the OpenStack project open. group in, uh, in Launchpad, and it gets emails about every bug that, uh, except for, you know, like private embargoed bugs and stuff it's not gonna hear about, but pretty much everything else, it gets all the emails for all bugs on all OpenStack projects, and um, checks its email uh, every few seconds, and then turns those messages into MQTT notifications, so you can, you can sniff on bug updates, new bugs, bugs closed, whatever, uh, on the fly as they're happening. Um, he also wrote a, uh, a link for our Gearman worker that uh, does the subunit processing for the subunit to SQL uh, effort that is at the back end right now for like health.openstack.org and so on. Um, and so you can see when logs are getting processed and uh, subunit data being uh, written to the, the back end. It's worth pointing out on the Launchpad one, we have the first actual event stream from Launchpad anywhere. Yes, yes, we invented the Launchpad event stream. Actually, the Launchpad admins probably have an event stream of some sort, but I've, it's not exposed to the public. I've asked Robert, he said no. Really? <laughs> wow. Maybe they want to use ours. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we did a fair amount of load testing of the, the server. So again, this is, this is load testing of the production two gig server as it's deployed. Um, this is just, and, yeah. and so for a baseline, this is prior to our load tests, just more or less what the, the current services that are deployed on there are doing from uh, a message rate perspective. So we've got uh, uh, two and a half. Yeah, spike, spiking up to around two and a half thousand messages yeah. per minute, minute uh, right now. And uh, actually, if you can go back. Uh, to, the, to that slide. Um, you can see the, the green line is, is basically the, the number of messages we're sending. The yellow line is higher because we have multiple subscribers listening to different parts, usually, of, of the fire hose. But you know, in, in total, the amount of traffic that they're receiving in aggregate, uh, the number of messages they're receiving is going to be higher because of duplication, multiple subscribers listening to the same messages, et cetera. And uh, this is the actual data throughput um, for, the, for the same server over the same period of time. Uh, you can see we're, we're basically uh, spiking up to two megabytes a minute, yeah, roughly. Um, we, we did some, some ad hoc load testing at first uh, just to kind of see how far we could push the system running some for loops and while loops in shell. Um, and trying to spin up lots of brokers and, or not brokers, lots of publishers and lots of subscribers. And uh, we, we pushed message rates up to around two million messages a minute. So pretty significant yeah. uh, throughput before we stopped with that effort. Um, and during that time, CPU uh, really didn't break about 35, I guess, percent utilization and memory, um, Really, most of the available memory was getting used for, for caching and, uh, and buffers. We got a little over 50% utilization um, for mostly for mosquito uh, 
daemon itself as, as we pushed in there. Um, though uh, we also think we might have had uh, a memory leak. Yeah, I think we somewhere. hit a memory leak because if you notice on the graph at two o'clock um, when it's at that dip, that's where the big spike is um, at two o'clock. Yeah, so we, we, we had done a restart at one point in there and that's kind of where the, the memory dropped off. So uh, evidence of probably some leakage or some really long-term caching that wasn't. Yeah. Uh, but what the restarts did show us was the network uh, reliability because while the yeah. broker was down, the clients were seamless and didn't even notice that we had lost the connection. Yeah. And uh, so after the, the ad hoc benchmarking, we, we tried to do some uh, slightly more structured benchmarking. Um, so these are basically graphs of where we varied uh, the number of publishers and number of subscribers with uh, a small tool Matt wrote that uh, the URL is, is on there uh, on the slide. Um, but basically it, it allows you to specify how many subscribers and how many publishers you want and it connects them all as, as separate uh, threads or sub-processes um, to the, the broker and then charts the throughput that it's getting. Uh, so we, we ranged from um, anywhere from one to 1,024 uh, subscribers and publishers uh, in an array and uh, stepped through that uh, exponentially just because the, the data points in between the exponential steps weren't really uh, very interesting. But this was uh, effectively showing that um, at, at low numbers of uh, subscribers and publishers, as, as you would expect, we were able to, to sustain um, a, a fair amount more. Um, we, we actually limited uh, the, the product of subscribers and publishers to no more than about 1024, mainly so that we didn't overrun the available bandwidth on the server. Um, but we were effectively pushing it at, you know, at the, the, the peak possible uh, bandwidth for that flavor without uh, particularly breaking a sweat. Um, so now that we have a reliable broker and we've got data publishing into it, it's useful to see how simple it is as an end user to start playing around with the data that we're getting. Um, the Mosquito Broker also publishes a number of C clients, or uh, publishes a C command line client called Mosquito Sub on uh, Ubuntu that's specifically the Mosquito clients package. I don't know why they split it out, but um, if you run that command, uh, just tell it to log into the host, firehose.openstack.org, and subscribe to the topic, pound. Um, that'll give you all of the message, because pound is the wild card, which means uh, accept everything after this, and if you don't specify anything earlier in the hierarchy, that's everything. Yeah, you'll, and, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be gulping from the fire hose, as yeah. we like to say. <laughs> or sticking it straight into your mouth. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes through, especially, well, maybe a little bit less now, it'll just be the Ansible, but during a normal work day, you have all of the Garrett traffic, plus all of the Ansible, plus all of the bugs, yeah. plus everything else. Um, but if you're, you know, want to get more targeted, I, you can listen to all of the comments on Garrett reviews on Nova. Um, specifically, I showed how to do it from the CLI here, which is the same command, but you specify the topic for Garrett OpenStack Nova comment added. But this also is an example if you wanted to listen to all of the OpenStack projects in the OpenStack namespace, you would replace Nova with a plus sign and that would wildcard it. Or if you wanted all Nova-related events, you would replace comment added with a plus. Yeah. It, it, it's worth noting that um, that is basically what uh, Zool and also a lot of third-party CI systems do. They're listening for comments and patch set created and so on events coming off the Garrett event stream. And right now we've got somewhere on the order of 200, I think, roughly, third-party CI systems connected to Garrett's SSH interface independently, all listening to everything coming out of the Garrett event stream. So this is, uh, this is an interesting way that, that some of that could possibly be backhauled. Yeah. Um, and then I showed how to do it in Python using the Eclipse Paho library, which you can see is the first import line, and it's actually very compact code. It does the exact same thing as the CLI, so when it gets the incoming message on that topic, it will just print it to standard out, but you could replace that bit to do whatever you wanted with. Um, and uh, thought that was a useful case. Or if you're um, an infrastructure developer, you're writing a package and you want to listen for all Ansible events, or you're just curious like I am because I have services deployed on health.openstack.org and I have no way of knowing if Puppet ran or not, um, you can subscribe to health.openstack.org uh, 
uh, Ansible task completion, which would be the puppet runs, or the Git clones as well. Um, and I sh thought it would be useful to show examples of how to do those kind of um, subscriptions as well. Um, in this case, I used Ruby because I figured why use the same language all the time if you can use everything. Um, and the Ruby is actually more compact than the Python code. I kind of like that. Yeah, you, you had to up the font size just I, to fill out the slide. Yes. Well, I did that partially because of the next language example, which is in Go, which is far more <laughs> verbose. <laughs> Um, and does the same exact thing as the Ruby. So you have, you know, whatever, eight lines versus that. If it was in C, it'd probably be a few more lines than that. Either. Yes, it would be. Um, so, and uh, the Go is using Paho, while Ruby was using um, something else on gems. I don't think it was Paho. Um, so uh, we, we, we've talked about where we can go from here. Um, obviously, we've, we've already got a pretty interesting working system. There's a number of possible use cases um, that are satisfied now, but uh, you know, we'd, we'd like to maybe start targeting third-party CI uh, as a specific use case for, for this, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you can use it for things like desktop notifications if you, uh, like uh, Matt was saying, watching the bug uh, updates coming from Launchpad. Maybe you want to subscribe to some specific bugs and you can you, yeah, sure, you could probably filter your bug notifications into a mailbox and have that notify you on your desktop, but you could also just run a MQTT client and have desktop, desktop notifications for specific things that you're interested in uh, in that regard. Um, also, uh, possible use for inter-service communication within the scope of infra. Um, right now, we've got a, a number of different systems that are interdependent, and uh, this gives us one possible way for them to trigger actions off of... Uh, uh, one another's uh, completion messages. Yeah. And on the desktop notifi notification front, it's also interesting to point out there are list bindings for all of those Emacs faithful, um, so they could get Emacs events triggered based off of MQTT. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 if their operating system is Emacs, then yeah. yeah. Um, one thing we have support for but aren't using quite yet is Garrett bot, the IRC bot. Um, supports MQTT. We just haven't flipped the switch to use that instead of the native SSH. Yep, that's, that's true. Um, so uh, we, we had a few future plans. Um, uh, for starters, for uh, the Gear MQTT uh, subscriber, we would like to try to get some integration with Zool after Zool v3 has uh, arrived. Um, and we were also talking about uh, Again, after Zool v3, probably getting uh, publishers in NodePool and Zool. Um, and uh, really, anything anybody can, can think of that uh, Infra is doing now that might make sense to add notifications for, we'd, we'd love input. Um, you know, just give, uh, give Matt or anybody on the Infra team a, a heads up, and, and we can kind of try to figure out what's, what's feasible to start exposing through this service. Yeah, the one we have pending right now is the log stash workers getting those to emit notifications yeah. into the MQTT stream. Right, yep, that's, uh, um, that's probably very soon to arrive. Yeah. I think we just need to review those patches a little longer. Yeah, we did play with the log stash output plugin for MQTT. We, uh, there's a, someone who wrote a plugin for log stash itself, um, but we quickly overrode the bandwidth limitations and was <laughs> crashing the log stash server. Yeah, as, as you can imagine, all of the logs out of all of our CI jobs, um, not really a good fit as content for a message bus, so. Um, so with that, I put a lot of links here for where you can get more information about Firehose, MQTT, and all of the things we're using. Um, we've got the docs there, as well as the schema docs, which uh, detail all of the specifics of how topics are generated dynamically as well as the payloads for each of the services. Um, and then the original spec and then MQTT and Mosquito. Um, and with that, uh, open the floor to questions. There are mics over there and I can also hand you one. Yep, it looks like we've still got at least a few more minutes. So anyone with curiosity about anything? Here's Thierry to heckle us. Um. So I arrived late, so maybe you covered this. Uh, the question is, should we use Firehose to feed events to Stack Analytics? I don't think we mentioned that. No. But that would, that, that's an interesting use case. Um, 
I don't know. I think Stackalytics probably wants to be able to reanalyze historical data, and um, but it could maintain its own database. I mean, you worry it, about it, sync. But. It could, yeah. We'd 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 have to catch it up first, and then yeah. I don't know. That's uh, it's an interesting proposition. It's worth thinking about. Um, uh oh. And if we thought we were being heckled by Thierry, here's Jim. Um, what's the uh, what's the plan with the stability of the schema as the underlying uh, services change? Um, <laughs> so I've. All of the things that are generating messages now are things I wrote. Um, I've been, I haven't changed anything because I work on other things and it's stable in that way, but if we need to change things, we can. Uh, the payloads aren't versioned right now, nor are the topics, but if we needed to make that switch, right now there aren't that many consumers, so it's easy to handle, but at some point we'll have to think of a way of do we want a stability contract on that schema and how we evolve things over time because our needs on the system are going to change as we gain users. Yeah, and I, th I think the, the, the first step toward it at least is that we, we do have some fairly extensive schema documentation now that yeah. Matt wrote because Matt did everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just standing here in support of Matt apparently. Um, <laughs> I, I reviewed a few changes. So, yeah. So how do we know the list of the topics? Is, oh. is there any? Yes, yeah, there, there, was, there, was, there was a slide. I um, don't think I'm on the Wi-Fi, but this link, um, yes, I'm not on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> and this resolution is fun. Um, so yeah, it, it was on one of the slides, but we've also definitely got documentation for that, which possibly Matt will be able to uh, access right here. I should have done this beforehand. I... You didn't know this was a live demo. I did not. But it's always fun to show off all of my bad English writing ability. Me speak English bad. Um, yeah, so you can see here for Garrett, for example, um, it documents the, how the topics are generated, so, and then all of the choices right there. Um, and for the actual payload, it points you to the Garrett docs because the payloads are literally copied directly from Garrett. Um, same for Launchpad. Um, and uh, subunit workers with example payloads. And then Ansible, which is the complicated one because it depends on the internal state of Ansible and the event it's emitting. But it's all documented. And if there are any gaps in here, please tell me or please push a patch because I tried to be as thorough as I could, but I might have missed something. Yeah, this is all documentation uh, in restructured text format in the OpenStack Infra System Config repository, um, as, as indicated there. Um, that, it's awesome, first, first of all. <laughs> um, so this morning there was a fishbowl called um, Achieving Resiliency at Scales of 10,000 Plus Nodes. Um, and there was some, uh, one of the outcomes from that was that as a community we'd like more performance regression testing so that like every time there's a Tempest run in the gate, for example, um, you could potentially, and I, I think some of this is already happening, like you, you, you could extract some metrics, um, maybe just a few simple ones or maybe later some a lot more in-depth ones, things like how well? I think we already capture how long the runtime of the, the Tempest run is, right? But uh, other things like how many bytes were put out on the message queue, um, just like performance metrics in general, where you could over time look out for regressions in is, is this particular code um, change having an impact? Is so? Is that kind of metric something that could pot potentially be published on this, and then something you know could could gather, subscribe, and gather um, metrics and see trends over time? So I don't think this is particularly suited for that application, but you're talking to the right person about doing data analysis off of gate results because I've spent a lot of time on that problem. Um, so the first thing we do right now is we have the OpenStack Health Dashboard, which tracks everything down to the test level and does um, database it does a, it keeps a database of all of the test run history so you can see the performance of an individual test over 
oh, um, right. an individual run over all time. Um, there's also an effort that has been currently abandoned but was in progress to do the performance counter aggregation that you were talking about um, and leverage some of our existing infrastructure to aggregate performance counters from systems on, on the machine like uh, MySQL and Rabbit and export those counters into StatsD or a different database where we could also do the same kind of aggregation that we're doing at the test level right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm spacing on the name, but what was what was that called in case anybody wanted to like get involved and pick that back up? I can't remember either. <laughs> right, well, yeah, hit us up in OpenStack QA or OpenStack Infra IRC channels and we'll dig up what the project name was. It was, it was abandoned for employer reasons, not, yeah. not technical reasons. Yeah, so right. Yeah, it was it, it, it was it was it was a great effort. It's just it currently is is lacking for uh, actual people to work on it. So, thanks. I have two questions. Okay. Um, the first one is you talk about InfluxDB DB using with this. There, can you get into that a little bit more? You, do you use Firehose as an like, aggregation tool? Or? Um, so we're not doing any aggregation on this. Um, what I was talking about just now, we have uh, test result aggregation uh, using a project I wrote a while back called Subunit to SQL, which takes the machine parsable output from test runs mm -hmm. and puts them in a MySQL database. And then we have tooling on top of that database to do the analytics and the visualization to show performance regressions and uh, general trends in our test running. I see. Second question, if I were to set this up in my infrastructure, mm -hmm. The question is how long did it take you and what you think, you know, how long would the next person do try to um, set this up? So for me, the primary gate was review bandwidth, but the actual writing of the code is very simple. Um, and the deployment was actually pretty straightforward as well with the, once I had the puppet modules fixed. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the puppet module that we're using for this is, is a very lightweight wrapper around install some system packages and put a couple of configuration files in place and reload a service when those change. So for example, like what you have in OpenStack there, it should be like, you talk about a week, two weeks? Yeah, probably, that okay. sounds reasonable. Great, thank you. Yeah, it, it's worth noting, since there are language bindings for basically every language under the sun, uh, you know, if, if, if what you're wanting to integrate uh, and, and emit messages from is source code that's under your control, then it's, it's fairly, trivial to add in 10, 20, 30 lines uh, of, of function call to emit whatever you want from wherever you want in the application's uh, execution. Is there any other questions? Okay, well then, thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs>